Okay. Thanks. Um, so I'll be talking about whether consciousness is an executive function. This is obviously a very broad question, and um, try I'll try to be a little bit more to specify a little bit what I will be talking about. So I will consider new imaging data mostly. Uh, so the typical story that if a stimulus is presented, uh, things happen in the brain, there is still some magic we don't fully understand, and then the subject is conscious and can report seeing the stimulus. So this basic question of perceptual awareness. But the idea here is not so much to understand the details of those mechanisms as much as to try to see how um, Cognitive neuroscience can really inform us on the nature of consciousness. I think we are far from understanding the details of the mechanism and that there are still a lot left to the magic wand. But still, um, the tools of cognitive neuroscience can help us defining what is the nature of consciousness. So that will be the main focus of my talk. And I will focus on the links between attention and uh, consciousness. So what do we know about consciousness and attention? We all have this intuition that attention is what determines what we experience, so that attention must be related with consciousness somehow. And this intuition has been formalized uh, in many definitions of consciousness and attention, starting with the uh, initial definition of James, uh, the famous everyone knows what attention is, and essentially it's related to consciousness. Uh, this is an idea that is found in many um, uh, uh, textbooks of uh, psychology with Wundt, etc. I won't do all the history, but then the most recent one I found was by Posner. Much can be learned about consciousness from an understanding of attention. So, um, why does the link between attention and consciousness matter? Well, it matters because if consciousness is tightly related with attention, then consciousness is essentially related to the family of executive functions. So understanding how consciousness is related to attention can let us know whether consciousness is related to um, executive functions in general or not. So there are essentially, essentially two views on consciousness uh, that could be summarized as function versus feeling. And um, on the consciousness as a function view, uh, you find a number of names, uh, including uh, Dennett that you've heard yesterday. And in this view, the role of consciousness is to di dispatch and control information. So in the presentation of the Global Workspace by Bars in 97, um, he wrote that consciousness is a facility for accessing, disseminating, and exchanging information, and for ex exercising global control and consciousness was essentially defined as a spotlight of attention shining on the stage of working memory. So this view is very popular in cognitive neuroscience um, because if consciousness is a function, then we already have all the tools and concepts to study it. We already have the idea that the brain works as a computer and that it can perform a number of functions that we can model and we can understand how it works. So we have all the... Um, um, background to uh, analyze what is consciousness in this view. The alternative view is more that consciousness is a feeling, and uh, this view has been developed by a number of people, and I will try to summarize this view by saying that in this case, consciousness is defined mostly by its experiential properties, the fact that seeing something does something to me rather than helping me doing something. Okay, so it's more a feeling, and its function is not really clear. But then it becomes very difficult to study this point of view using the tools of cognitive neuroscience. And this is not at the hard problem defined by Chanmas, that the hard problem is hard precisely because it's not a problem about the performance of functions. The problem persists even when all the performance of all the relevant functions is explained. And so the biological implementation of this view is much more difficult to imagine. So, if now we consider these two views, rather than trying to find directly the neural implementation of this view versus this view, we can try a, a side approach, which would be to look at how consciousness is related to attention. Because clearly this view makes a clear prediction that consciousness is tightly linked to attention, whereas in this view, consciousness as a feeling, consciousness could be some more independent from attention. 
So if we go back to what we know about consciousness and attention in terms of uh, experimental data, uh, we have a lot of behavioral evidence to show that if there is no attention, there is no consciousness. You probably all know the famous gorilla experiment where you don't see the gorilla crossing the scene because you are paying attention to the players wearing a white t-shirt. And um, it has been shown that, for instance, attention enhances perceived contrast, meaning that if you see things um, appearing brighter, then you are more likely to be conscious of them. And typically, this grading compared to this one, if this grading is attended by using a cue presented at that location uh, a short time before, it will have appear brighter than it really is. So this idea that attention selects the information that is needed uh, for consciousness can be viewed like this. If you imagine the mind as this iceberg, then you get a bulk of unconscious information. And for information to reach the conscious mind, it has to be selected and amplified to reach the top. So uh, this is a kind of view developed in the fame in the brain uh, scheme of Dennett or in the global workspace of uh, Bass and De Hen. And here is a more um, computational view of the global workspace where you can get um, sensory detectors that can be activated by a stimulus, but if the information is not attended, information remains there. It does not reach the global workspace, um, which, to make things short, would be located in the frontal parietal regions. And it's only with the help of attention that it can reach this part, and then information can go down and be dispatched to other parts of the system. And if we now consider neural data, they are converging evidence. For instance, the frontal parietal network um, is known to be very important in orienting attention. And it's also showing up in many uh, experimental neuroimaging studies on consciousness. Um, so this frontal parietal network could be involved in both attention and consciousness. Another point of converging evidence uh, is on oscillatory synchrony um, that has been proposed to be involved in both attention and consciousness. So the original ideas about oscillatory synchrony is that you get different, uh, if you present a visual stimulus, you get activation in various uh, visual areas, and those areas respond to different type of information. In some, the receptive fields are small, in some, they are large, in some, you see black and white and high frequencies, in other, colored information with low spatial frequencies. But then at some point, the activity in all these areas gets synchronized in an oscillatory mode, and you can bind all those information together. And this corresponds to the point where you put the pieces of the puzzles together and you consciously recognize, of course, it's a hedgehog in a flower pot. So um, this idea that a selected story synchrony uh, is linked with the subjective percept, so the content of consciousness, um, has, has found some experimental support. And it's also it nicely accounts for the idea that awareness is not localized to a precise, in a precise region of the brain, but more depends on interactions between different regions and um, that you don't need to have a small brain into the brain to decide what you be conscious or not. But oscillatory synchrony has also been proposed to be involved in attentional selection. So the mechanism for this would be that if you get a population of neurons synchronized in an oscillatory mode, this defines windows during which those neurons will be active uh, because their membrane potential is locked for instance, they would be more excitable in this state, so they are more likely to emit excitatory uh, potentials during the same time window, which means that this information will be integrated in the target neuron and that this target neuron is very likely to uh, fire a spike. So information from population of neurons that are synchronized in an oscillatory manner is relayed and amplified. On the other hand, if you have a population of neurons that is not um, synchronized, then you get EPSPs one after the other, and these EPSPs will not send in the target neuron and information won't be relayed. So again, this idea has gained um, a number of um, experimental support. 
So if I try to summarize this view that attention acts as a gateway for consciousness, the idea would be that you see a stimulus, you get activity in sensory regions that are amplified by attention, and then you get a more uh, widespread network um, that is coordinated by oscillatory synchrony. And then the subject can report that he has seen the stimulus. So, in this, uh, so these views that attention selects and amplifies those signals that reach consciousness explains whale behavior, and it seems to fit with neural data. And so that's the end of the talk, no, not completely, uh, because there is a but in this. Um, and there are a number of criticisms that one can make to this view. The first one is that in your imaging study, the link between attention and consciousness has always been assumed, but never tested. And I think that's a problem for um, a scientific line of reasoning that to rely on assumption can be quite dangerous, especially when assumptions fit our own intuitions. And the second problem is that uh, most of the convergence I've presented, in particular concerning the frontoparietal system, uh, comes from experiments in which there was no formal distinction between attention and consciousness. So let me give you an example. So this is the attentional blink paradigm. So you are probably familiar with it. So the subject sees a series of letters, and then he has to report first whether there was a B, C, or D in this stream of letters, and then whether there was an X. So here you can see that the subject would say, yes, there is a C, and then later on, in half of the cases, it would make, miss the X, because the X appears in a time window during which the brain is not available to process this information because it's processing information regarding the first target. So this is called the attentional blink. This is what you can see here. T2 accuracy drops at a given SOA after the first target. And this same paradigm has been used by different researchers to study either consciousness or to study attention. And of course, in all of these studies, um, the sources were, uh, of the effect were found mostly in the frontoparietal system. But then, this is just to illustrate the fact that um, you find some convergence of neural evidence between attention of consciousness, but that's partly because there is no distinction between attention of, and consciousness right at the beginning. So before getting into experiments, um, I just would like to present a little bit more what could be the models for the relationships between attention and consciousness and what could be the experimental predictions of this model. Um, so the first model is what I would call the gateway hypothesis. This is the most popular one. Um, and in this view, you get an attentional amplification that leads to consciousness and the subject makes a decision to report the stimulus as seen. So in this model, the attentional amplification of neural signals should be larger in seen trials than in unseen trials. And uh, the neural correlates of consciousness should depend on attention, okay? because there is a strict dependency between the two. Um, just one precision, um, I've added here this decisional component because to measure consciousness, the only way we have so far is uh, to use the subject's report, and this report is in itself a decisional process. So I think it's important to integrate this notion to, to account for real data. The alternative view is that attention and consciousness are two different things, but they feed the same decisional process, but potentially with different weights. So that in the end, the report of the subject can be influenced by attention or by consciousness, but that these two things could be two different independent uh, process in the brain. So in this case, we would get at the neural level uh, an independence between the correlates of attention and consciousness. And at the behavioral level, well, there can be an interaction, but it's not necessary. So it should be more flexible in this case. Okay, so um, if we go now to experiments, um, so you know that we don't have any good definition either of attention or of consciousness, um, but we have operational definitions. We can decide that this is a state where the subject is aware or this is a state where the subject was attending. And so for visual awareness, we rely on the subjective report of the subject and for spatial attention, it's um, the 
classical measure of shorter reaction times at the attended location. And if we accept those two operational definitions, then we can build a paradigm in which we study jointly uh, attention and consciousness. So in this experiment, um, the subject fixates, and there is a cue orienting attention toward this location. Then later on, the stimulus appears, and the, the subject has to decide what was the orientation of the stimulus. So that would be a typical attentional um, uh, paradigm. The only thing we changed is that we use stimuli that are at threshold for consciousness, so extremely difficult to perceive. And we added a question asking the subject whether he thought a stimulus was present or not. So in this design, um, the same physical stimulus can be either attended or unattended if it appears here, as it happens from time to time. And depending on what the subject says, it can be consciously perceived or not. So if we look at behavioral data in this case, um, stimuli are seen consciously more often on the attended side. So this replicates many behavioral data in the literature, and this leads to the idea that attention is necessary for consciousness. But if we look the other way around, um, the typical shortening of reaction times um, by attention occur, but only if the subject was aware of the stimulus. So in this view, then one could consider that awareness is necessary for attention. So from behavior, we, can, we get this kind of circular line of reasoning that A implies B, B implies A, so A is equivalent to B, or the story is more complex. So to study the story in more details, we use MEG recordings. And um, so I'm presenting here a time frequency analysis of those recordings, so you get time here. Here is the attentional cue, the stimulus and frequencies, and red means a lot of energy in a given frequency burn, so you can see here that after the stimulus, despite the fact that we have very weak stimuli, we nevertheless get a response over uh, occipital regions, and if we analyze this response uh, in a statistical <coughs> manner, so using the um, two-by-two -two design, uh, the results of the ANOVA show that we have um, oscillations around 60 hertz that are related to awareness, oscillations around 80 hertz that are related to attention, and there was no interaction between the two. So if we now look at this in more details, if we really look at oscillations around 60 hertz in this time window, um, oh, sorry, I'm missing part of the slide. Um, so for a stimulus on the left, you get a nice response on the right. Uh, for a stimulus on the right, you get a nice response on the left. Uh, but you get nothing for stimuli that were not consciously seen by the subject. Okay, so this is what was shown by the ANOVA. And now what is important is that this effect is of the same size for attended and unattended stimuli. So what you have here is the bar graph of disactivation for aware stimuli in dark gray and for unaware stimuli in light gray. And you can see that the difference between the two is significant for both attended and unattended stimuli. So clearly here we do not have an attentional amplification that is larger for seeing stimuli. And we could further source localize this activity in the lateral occipital complex. If we now look around 80 hertz, so the attention related activity, again we get an activity that has a retinotopic organization, so it's coming from the visual system. And what you can see is that you get a nice response for attended stimuli, nothing much for unattended stimuli. But what is important is that this effect was independent from consciousness, so that you always get larger responses for attended stimuli and very small responses for unattended stimuli. So this experiment shows that spatial attention and visual awareness can appear as distinct and independent neural processes. Uh, so this is uh, quite counterintuitive, but if we admit this idea of a cumulative influence, then it can fit um, so that we get independence of attention and consciousness at the neural level, but because they feed the same decisional process, we get a behavioral interaction between the two. So we tried to see whether we could get um, a sense of this influence here, and for this, we moved to a single trial analysis. Here we used, um, I would say, 
like is done usually in electrophysiology, we averaged all the aware trials and all the unaware trials of a given subject and then did a group analysis. Here we really moved to single trial data in each single subject to see if we could get a more fine-grained uh, analysis. So what we did is that we looked at the 60 hertz activities that we know to be related to consciousness, and then we binned um, the data according to the amount of this activity. So here you have uh, trials in which there was only a little bit of this awareness-related activity, and here trials where there is a lot of this uh, activity. And what we plotted here was how often the subject was aware of the stimulus. Okay, so by definition, because this activity is related to awareness, you get a nice correlation, meaning that if there is only a bit of this activity, subject does not see the stimulus, and that if there is a lot of this activity, then the subject is much more likely to see the stimulus. If you repeat the same analysis, but this time with the attention-related gamma, we find that there is still a correlation. The slope of this correlation is much smaller. So this is what is rep represented here. This is the mean of the slope for the awareness-related gamma across subjects and for the attention-related gamma. So here, what we have is that we have two activities that did not show any correlation uh, between them, but that both influence the final decisional process, but with different weights. Okay, it's roughly, uh, it's a much smaller weight for the attention-related activity. So this tends to confirm uh, the uh, validity of this model. Still, there is a problem with those data, uh, which is that when the subject um, reports seeing the stimulus, okay, he is very good at discriminating the orientation, which is kind of obvious, meaning that in aware trials they are 80% correct, and in unaware trials they are at chance, which is what we would expect. Okay, if you don't see the stimulus, you are chance. Uh, this was a lack of an internal control, but this raises a problem that we have a confound in those data between awareness and accuracy. Um, because subjective experience comes together with a high quality of visual representation, when we look at neural correlates, we simply don't know what we see, whether it's related to the subjective experience of the subject or whether it's related to this high quality visual representation. And this is intrinsic to most studies of visual awareness in normal subjects because one of the definition of not being conscious is not being able to process the stimulus properly. So um, this awareness related gamma, is it related to subjective experience or is it related to the quality of the visual representation? So to answer this question, we move to a patient, patient GY. So GY is blind, he has a massive lesion that includes V1 and V2. Um, but this patient shows blind sight, which means when he's forced to answer to a stimulus presented in his blind field, he can be better than chance at distinguishing some basic um, parameters, like whether the stimulus was tilted like this or like that. And um, GY can orient his attention in his blind field. So this was one of the um, first evidence by Bob Kentridge that attention can operate on unconscious stimuli. And GY has been tested for many years and he has developed what is called type two blind sight, which is an awareness that something happens. So he's not hallucinating, he's perfectly sane. Uh, the analogy he gives is that sometimes when something is presented in his blind field, he has a feeling that something is there. It's not a visual experience. And the way he describes it, it's like when you have someone on your back. Okay? You are not hallucinating anything. You know that it's not very reliable or whatever, and usually you just turn your head. So for GY, it's just the same. I mean, for him, it's just that his visual field is restricted. So if you bring something to him on this side, he turns his head because he has a feeling something is there. Okay, so it's not a regular visual experience, but it's a kind of awareness. And so what's interesting with GY is that we can decouple between the quality of the information that is processed because he has blind sight, so he can answer even if he does not see, and a form of phenomenal experience which is not the same as in normal subjects, but which is a form of uh, phenomenal experience. So uh, we tested him with a paradigm that is very similar to what we use in normal subjects, so um, an attentional cue, so his blind field is here, an attentional cue pointing either to the upper or lower part of his blind field, a stimulus, 
uh, that was designed to maximize um, this awareness healing. And then we asked what was the orientation of the stimulus, whether it was tilted to the left or to the right, and then whether he had any form of awareness. And behaviorally, he is as accurate to report the orientation of the stimulus in aware and unaware triads. Okay, so this is a typical uh, blind side thing that he is able to respond, although he is blind. And then he gets the attentional shortening of reaction times for both aware and unaware trials. So all the behavioral parameters are now perfectly equal. And GY spent put him a whole weekend in the MEG scanner uh, so that we could collect enough data. And here are the MEG results. So you can see, so time zero is stimulus onset. You can see again that we get gamma band oscillations over his lesioned visual areas. So we have no idea where this is coming from. Uh, it's not, obviously not coming from the lesion, but I mean it's very difficult to be more precise about the sources of this activity. And if we look in more detail at this gamma band activity, so using the same kind of ANOVA analysis, we can find that in the first time window we get a main effect of awareness, and in the second time window a main effect of attention, and no interactions between the two. So again we get around 50 hertz in GY, an activity that is much larger when he has this phenomenal experience than when he doesn't have it, and it's not influenced by the attentional validity of the stimulus. And the other way around, if we look uh, at this activity, uh, we get a pure attentional effect, so a difference between valid and invalid trials that is not affected by um, ph phenomenal experience. Okay? What we found in GY, this additional attentional low frequency, lower frequency thing we did not have in, in normal subjects. But I mean, qualitatively, we get similar results as in normal subjects, so this suggests that the dissociation we found between attention and consciousness is not due to performance confound. So this clearly suggests that this model is not valid, except that what we found was an attentional amplification that was pretty late compared to the neural correlates of awareness. And for those of you who are electrophysiologists, it's well known that there is a first wave of attentional amplifications in early extra striate areas, around 90, 100 milliseconds, uh, that we could not observe on those um, oscillatory synchrony data. So we moved to a slightly different design where we used masking so that we could have targets that were still uh, oriented gradings, but with a much higher contrast and that were masked so that they were perceived in only half of the trials. And um, again, attention was oriented toward or away from the target, and the stimulus could be perceived or not. But this time, we could get strong transient um, responses to um, the stimulus. And we could isolate this early attentional amplification. So you can see here for a target presented on the left, uh, for a validly cute target, you get a large response and a much smaller one for an unattended target. And this is what you can see here. And importantly, this early attentional amplification was present for stimuli that did not reach consciousness. Okay, so clearly this early um, attentional amplification had no causal role in um, seeing consciously the stimulus. So this clearly um, is not in line with the gateway hypothesis. Sorry. And then in this experiment, we also had um, correlates of consciousness in the evoked responses, around 120 milliseconds, so for seen stimuli, and not much for unseen stimuli over temporal regions. And what you can see here is that for seen stimuli in red, the response was earlier and larger than for unseen stimuli in blue. This effect was exactly similar for unattended trials. Okay, so here we get neural correlates of consciousness that are independent from attention. So again, this argues in favor of this uh, cumulative influence hypothesis rather than the gateway hypothesis. There was something interesting in those data, which is that the response was not only larger, but it was also earlier. So um, you remember at the beginning, I told you that behaviorally, it appears that attention acts as if it was enhancing the perceived contrast. I mean, it increases the saliency at the attended location by enhancing perceived contrast. This is what you can deduce from behavioral data. 
that if you pay attention here, for instance, you will see this grading as brighter than this one, for instance. Um, what is also pretty well known in electrophysiology is that if you increase the contrast of a stimulus, the response will start earlier. So these are monkey data where you can see that the response starts earlier if the contrast of the stimulus is 100% compared to a 50% contrast stimulus. So these are data from the group of John Bonsall where they try to see whether indeed attention enhances perceived contrast, meaning that it should shift the latency of the response. And it's absolutely not the case. Uh, so this replicates negative findings from the human ERP literature. So what you can see here are responses to uh, stimuli of different contrasts for uh, unattended in light gray and attended stimuli in light gray, in dark gray. So, so you can see that the response to attended stimuli is always larger than to unattended stimuli. That's just a classical thing. But the latency of the responses to attended and unattended is not different. And this is true at all contrast level and even at very low contrast. If something, then the latency of unattended stimuli comes earlier. So attention does enhance response magnitude, but it does not shorten response latency. So it cannot be responsible for the behavioral effects that are obs observed. And in our data, the only place where we find an advance in latency is for the comparison between seen and unseen stimuli. And if we measure the latency and compare between hits and misses, we get clearly a significant difference that responses to hits are shorter than responses to misses, even though those stimuli have exactly the same contrast. So um, attention does not shorten response latency, but consciousness does. So again, this argues against uh, the gateway hypothesis. Um, another thing that I said in the beginning is that very often consciousness is associated with activity in the frontal parietal network. And um, in our data, we always found the consciousness effects to be confined uh, to higher order visual regions, but not to frontal parietal regions. Uh, so not finding something does not prove that it's not there, of course, but um, we just wanted to make sure that it was not a problem of sensitivity of our analysis and all these kind of things. So what we did is that we designed an experiment where uh, we manipulated uh, something, a different parameter that is known to activate the parietal cortex. So in this experiment, the subject had a color cue and then appeared a grading that was on a colored analysis. Uh, the subject task was to report the orientation of this grating and whether the grating was, um, he thought the grating was present or absent. And um, the, grade, the grading could be congruent with the color of the cue or not. Okay, so we have this color congruency effect which is known to activate parietal regions. Um, and in MEG data, if we analyze what is related to um, consciousness, so by sorting between seen and unseen trials, we, in evoked responses, we again find activity in left and right lateral occipital regions that is larger for seen stimuli than for unseen stimuli. But we also find parietal activity that is related to congruency, so that it's larger for, congru for incongruent trials than for congruent uh, trials but it does not matter whether the stimulus is reported as seen or unseen. Okay, so we are not finding consciousness-related activity in the parietal region nor in frontal region, and this is not due to a problem of sensitivity because in the same experiment, same subject, same everything, we can find activity in the parietal regions. So the interim conclusion would be that we find a neural dissociation between attention and awareness with a sensory correlate of awareness that is independent from spatial attention that is present both in evoked responses or gamma band oscillations that we find consistently to be located in the lateral occipital region and that is not due to better performance. We also find an attentional amplification that is as large for seen and unseen stimuli and that can appear early or late in the process. What we also find is that both processes um, run independently, but they can both contribute to the final report, uh, but with different weights. 
So the experimental results clearly fit much better with the cumulative influence hypothesis than with the more classical gateway hypothesis. <clears throat> there is something else that was, uh, there is another difference between the predictions between those two uh, models in terms of behavioral interactions. Here, clearly, you expect to always find a behavioral interaction between attention and consciousness, whereas here, well, it can depend. It's not necessary. So we, we therefore investigated whether behaviorally um, we could find um, different reports. So this time, so we used the same kind of paradigm, but um, we used a central cue that could be predictive or not of the location of the stimulus. So here the idea is that if I tell you in advance, okay, watch the arrows, they will indicate you where is the most likely location of the stimulus. This will help you to perform the task and you are, more likely, you are very likely to use this information. If on the other hand I tell you, okay, don't pay attention to the arrows, they do not indicate anything. The stimulus can appear here or there, they are not indicating anything. Okay, here you will not voluntarily use these cues, but it's known that if, even if the arrows are not predictive, you still have, you still, it still triggers some involuntary attentional mechanisms. And the idea was that, that voluntary and automatic components of attention may interact differently with consciousness. So for voluntary attention, we had the cue was predictive of the location of the stimulus, and then 35% of the time, the stimulus appeared at the unattended location. We also had, in the same uh, in the different group of subjects, a situation where there was involuntary attention, so that uh, was triggered, and this was just because the, the um, sorry the arrow was not predictive of the cue location. So what we find is that both voluntary and involuntary attention facilitate detection, but voluntary at attention shortens discrimination reaction times in scene trials which is the classical results, so you are faster to report the orientation uh, of this stimulus when this stimulus was attended. The surprise came from involuntary attention. In this case, attention shortened uh, the reaction times in unseen trials. Okay, so this was completely counterintuitive. How can attention do something on a stimulus I haven't seen? So when something is counterintuitive, the, the first possibility is that it's a mistake. So we rerun the experiment, but this time um, we used a counter-predictive task so that we could have both voluntary and involuntary forms of attention to operate in the same trials in the same subjects. So in a counter-predictive experiment, the arrows point here, but most of the time the stimulus falls at the other location. Okay? So your automatic attention is driven here, but your voluntary attention is driven here because you know the rule. It's been told in advance to the subject, look at the uh, location opposite to, what the arrows, uh, to where the arrows is pointing. And if we do that, what we find is that for seen stimuli, subjects are faster at the predicted location, so the one that is controlled by voluntary attention, but they were faster uh, for unseen trials, they were faster at the location predicted by uh, automatic attention. So those results suggest that depending on whether or not you are conscious of the stimulus, different forms of attention may operate, which is just reversing the usual uh, hierarchical dependence between attention and consciousness. Okay, so... Um, we had two predictions for this model, which was mainly the independence of attention and consciousness at the neural level and the possibility of flexible behavioral interactions. And um, both those uh, predictions are uh, satisfied. The last point is that um, to, to interpret our data, we had to uh, introduce this decisional component um, of consciousness. And um, we looked in the data whether there was anything to suggest that indeed there is a decision. Um, we have hints that there is our decisional processes uh, working when the subject has to report whether he has seen the stimulus or not. So considering consciousness as a perceptual decision is both very old and new, 
Uh, it's all in the sense that visual psychophysics and the signal detection theory is all about um, seeing something as a result of a decisional process. But um, the neural correlates of consciousness, or so the many neuroimaging studies on the neural consciousness, of, or the neural correlates of consciousness, are rather mute on this issue. So briefly, the perceptual decision-making framework, the idea is that uh, to take a decision, you integrate sensory information into a decision variable, so that starts at an initial level, and that accumulates sensory evidence until you reach a threshold. Okay? And then our idea is that the awareness-related gamma and the attention-related gamma that I showed in the first experiment could contribute to this decisional process. But we were interested in this initial level, because in our data, uh, so of the first experiment I presented, we actually find correlates of consciousness even before stimulus onset. So this is something which is quite classical in electrophysiology, that if you look before stimulus onset, you can already predict whether the subject is going to be aware of the stimulus or not. And usually, uh, this pre-stimulus activity is considered to reflect attention. We were, of course, not satisfied with this interpretation, and uh, we considered that, okay, uh, the classical attentional account means that the cortical state, um, the cortex, in, is in a given state of excitability, meaning that if a stimulus arrives, it will give a large response. Or it can also be, that's an alternative possibility, that the initial level of your decision variable to decide whether or not something was there is not uh, set in the same way. So just to give an intuition about this, imagine that this man is jumping on the trampoline and the decision of seeing the stimulus is reached if he jumps until here, for instance. So he can jump high because the trampoline is very well stretched. That would be cortical excitability. Or he can jump high because this pedestal is very high. Okay? And that would be the initial level of the decision variable. So the two do not have to be correlated necessarily. So if we want to formalize this idea, it's more like, okay, if we take cortical excitability, then it means that pre-stimulus activity is, uh, determines the amplitude of the response to the stimulus, so to post-stimulus activity, and then feeds the decision. If we take the pedestal, then the idea is that you get something in pre-stimulus activity that directly impacts the decision, but that has nothing to do with the response to the stimulus itself. So to look at this in the data, we looked at the residual correlation um, of the predictive power of the pre-stimulus on the decision once we partial out the correlation between pre- and post-stimulus activity, and this is what is presented here. We still get a, signific a significant predictive power of pre-stimulus uh, activity. So this means that pre-stimulus influence of consciousness is not necessarily attentional, and it also shows the importance of considering decisional processes in consciousness research. Okay, so um, this showed that we were certainly right to introduce this component uh, in our models. So to conclude, uh, all the experimental data that I've presented you um, clearly favor the cumulative influence hypothesis and uh, contradict the gateway hypothesis so this suggests that uh, at the neural level, attention and consciousness are distinct processes. So we are back to the question of function versus feeling. And um, we can consider attention as a true function whose um, set priorities either in a bottom-up or in a top-down manner. So it helps you focusing on the task at hand, and, uh, but you can also process salient stimuli that are unexpected because it cap captures attention in a bottom-up manner. But this function can operate completely independently from consciousness, and it has a direct impact on performance, even during unconscious processing, and there are more and more studies uh, showing uh, the influence of attention uh, during unconscious processing, in, even in behavioral data. Consciousness in this view um, is not related to high quality vision. It's not a uh, high level cognitive function, but it's more related to the ability to feel or to have a sensation. And it's not necessarily connected to cognitive abilities or to good performance. 
So from an annual point of view, consciousness may not belong to the family of high-level cognitive functions, um, which means that it's much more difficult to study because we have no idea uh, what could be the biological basis in this case because we don't have the whole background of cognitive neuroscience. Um, so we are back to the heart problem. If consciousness is not a cognitive function, then how it is implemented? We have shown uh, activity uh, in the lateral occipital circuits, but that's certainly not sufficient to explain consciousness because you can get some degree of activation of this region uh, during unconscious processing. So it's, it's uh, maybe necessary to have a high level of activity, but certainly not sufficient to explain consciousness. So this subjective uh, dimension, first-person experience, could be based on the uh, integration of the ex external world with the neural representation of the internal state of the body, because um, this could bring in the first-person uh, dimension that is needed to account even for perceptual consciousness um, that I presented here. Uh, so those ideas have been uh, developed by a number of people, but there isn't much uh, neural evidence so far for this. And if anyone is interested in working on this, I've got a postdoctoral position available um, to work on this. Uh, so to finish, I would like to thank uh, all my um, students, uh, more senior collaborators, GY, the excellent uh, staff of the MEG Center, and uh, funding support. Thank you for your attention.